Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk general aviation with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. I'm the author of several books on the Garmin G1000, G3000, G5000, and Perspective Glass Cockpits, and the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year. Today, we're talking in detail with Rob Mark about VFR into IMC accidents. And if you think, well, you already know everything there is to know about those accident types, I'm guessing you don't, as I learned a number of new things while researching this episode. Please take a listen and see if you don't learn at least three new things about these insidious accidents that continue to plague general aviation. Last week in episode 227, we talked about a near-fatal icing accident that I had 30 years ago in a Cessna 182 when I was a relatively low-time pilot. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out at aviationnewstalk.com slash 227. And this is a listener-supported show, and we're still ad-free. So please join us. Sign up to become a member and support the show financially at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And when you do, I'll read your name on the show. This week in the news, AOPA's Air Safety Foundation has a new online course about VFR into IMC accidents. Southwest Airlines can't hire as many pilots as they'd planned to, and we'll tell you why. And once again, we have a number of aviation-related crime stories, including another naked guy. All this and more, and the news starts now. From generalaviationnews.com, new VFR into IMC safety campaign launches. AOPA's Air Safety Institute has launched a new campaign, VFR into IMC Avoidance and Escape. The campaign, which runs from now through the end of the year, is designed to focus efforts and outreach on addressing the most significant cause of weather-related accidents in GA, VFR into IMC. VFR into IMC is among the top five causes of fatal GA accidents, which are largely preventable, said ASI Senior Vice President Richard McSpadden. And it's not only VFR pilots who get trapped. About one-third of these accidents involve instrument-rated pilots. The campaign includes a new VFR into IMC safety spotlight based on a research study from ASI that revealed pilots encounter these conditions every other week on average. Experience alone is no guard against them, he says. In fact, instrument-rated commercial pilots are twice as likely to be involved in VFR into IMC accidents compared to their non-instrument-rated counterparts. Often thought of as a single cause, VFR into IMC plays a role in several other types of accidents, including loss of control and control flight into terrain. The campaign's materials, programs, and upcoming events are packaged in a new online resource center with links to the new safety spotlight, videos, podcasts, articles, and webinars. The center will be updated throughout the year as more materials and events become available. Now, I've taken the online course and it's excellent and I recommend that you take it as well. Later in the show, we'll talk about more surprising facts about VFR and IMC accidents, when we talk with award-winning aviation journalist, Rob Mark. From the Textron Aviation website, Textron brings new upgrades to iconic Piston product lineup. The new production Beechcraft Bonanza G36 will now offer a 155 pound increase to the maximum takeoff weight, giving the aircraft a maximum useful load of 1,213 pounds in its standard configuration with six seats. In addition to the increased gross weight, new production Bonanzas along with Beechcraft Baron G58 aircraft will offer three new interior schemes and a new cockpit layout with a standalone autopilot controller. New Bonanzas and Barons will also include a Garmin GI275 electronic standby, a carbon monoxide detector, USB ports at every seat, powered headset plugs in the cockpit, and updated LED exterior lighting for improved visibility. New models of each aircraft are anticipated to be delivered in mid-2022. Also, all new production Cessna high-wing piston aircraft will also include a Garmin GI275 electronic standby. The standby modernizes the cockpit panel by eliminating three analog standby instruments and providing additional flight data. The interior of Cessna high-wing piston aircraft will also feature a refresh. From dailynews.com, Southwest Airlines slows pilot hiring on instructor shortfall. Southwest is slowing plans to hire pilots as the carrier grapples with a shortage of flight instructors. The company expects to bring on more than 1,200 first officers this year, down 148 from its earlier projections. Southwest still needs and is actively recruiting for the job. Flight instructors primarily oversee classroom curriculum and training on equipment and flight simulators for new pilots and for those upgrading to captain. They also supervise periodic required training for the airline's aviators. 
It's a bottleneck, Casey Murray, president of Southwest Airline Pilots Association, said. They are doing the best they can, but they just don't have the people for the amount of training needed. While Southwest isn't short of pilots, the situation heightens uncertainty about the Dallas-based carrier has already faced shortages of workers from baggage handlers to gate agents to cabin cleaners. A large number of employees retired or accepted buyouts when travel demand collapsed during the height of the pandemic. The airline's flying capacity this quarter will decline 7% from 2019 levels, due in part to staffing challenges. Southwest, which has about 8,300 aviators, is facing competition from pilot training companies like CAE and Flight Safety International. From GeneralAviationNews.com, distracted pilot fails to extend landing gear. According to the pilot, due to weather in the local area, he elected to conduct a straight-in landing approach rather than overfly the runway at the airport in Buckland, Alaska. After slowing the Piper PA-31's airspeed, he selected flaps down to 15 degrees, landing gear down, followed by full flaps. The pilot told investigators that he was distracted by standing water on the runway, and he failed to confirm the landing gear was in the down and locked position. After landing, and realizing that the landing gear was not extended, he checked the landing gear handle, which was in the down neutral position with no landing gear indicator lights illuminated. The pilot surmised that upon selection of the landing gear handle on the approach, he must have failed to place the landing gear handle in the full down position. In the recommendations section of the NTSB accident incident reporting form, the pilot stated that the accident may have been prevented if he had followed the airplane's checklist and not allowed the distractions and deviations from routine to alter his normal procedures. Probable cause, the pilot's failure to extend the landing gear before landing due to distraction by the condition of the runway and his failure to use the before landing checklist. And as we've talked before on the show, the NTSB has listed distractions as one of the major factors in GA accidents. And we spent an entire episode, episode 43, devoted to dealing with distractions. From generalaviationnews.com, pilot hits tree while herding cattle. The helicopter pilot was herding cattle when the Robinson R-22's tail rotor hit a mesquite tree branch near Seymour, Texas. The helicopter began a yaw to the right and made two full rotations as the pilot maneuvered to open terrain. He rolled the throttle off, stopped the yaw, and the helicopter landed hard. An examine of the helicopter conducted by FAA inspectors also did not find any mechanical anomalies. Probable cause? The pilot's failure to maintain clearance from a tree while maneuvering at low altitude. From Yahoo.com, backyard landings in helicopter could land East Brookfield, Massachusetts man in prison for a long time. A federal jury in Worcester has convicted an East Brookfield man of illegally flying a helicopter around his property and lying to the FAA. Antonio Santanas Tasso, who authorities say previously participated in the theft of a helicopter from a Norwood airport, was convicted following a three-day trial on three or four charges he faced. A jury convicted him of one count of serving as an airman without an airman certificate, one count of making false statements to federal agents, and one count of attempted witness tampering. It acquitted him of one count of making false statements to other agencies. According to a news release, Santonas Tasso, age 62, flew a Robinson R-22 helicopter, taking off and landing from his backyard more than 50 times between April and November of 2018, despite having no pilot's license. Santanas Tasso had lost his license in 2000 after he participated in the theft of a helicopter, authorities said, but when questioned about that by the FAA, he made false statements regarding his eligibility to pilot the helicopter. Specifically, he falsely claimed that the events that gave rise to the FAA's revocation of his license were a fabrication. Evidence at trial also established that he attempted to corruptly persuade an individual with the intent to hinder, delay, and prevent that individual from reporting his illegal helicopter flights to law enforcement. According to the DA's office, he is due to be sentenced October 5th and faces up to 20 years in prison, up to three years of supervised release, and a fine of a quarter of a million dollars. The U.S. Attorney's Office said Mr. Santonas Tasso demonstrated a blatant disregard for FAA rules and regulations by operating a helicopter out of his backyard without a license on numerous occasions. Every time he did so, he endangered himself, his community, and the general public on the ground. From caa.co.uk, helicopter pilot sentenced for forging license. A UK commercial helicopter pilot has been sentenced to 24 months imprisonment with a suspended sentence for 24 months 
for forging revalidations in his pilot's license, making false entries in his personal flying log, and flying a helicopter without an appropriate license. Giles Dumper, 41, of Horley, West Sussex, was sentenced after previously pleading guilty to 14 charges related to forgery, making false entries, and flying without an appropriate license. He held a commercial pilot's license to fly helicopters, but forged his qualification to fly particular types of helicopters and forged entries in his log covering up the forgeries. The CAA has revoked his license. Commenting on the case, Allison Slater, head of investigations and enforcement at CAA, said, Offenses of this kind compromise aviation safety. The CAA has taken and will continue to take appropriate actions to protect the public. From NewsWest9.com, this is a follow-up to a story we reported several months ago. Pilot who crashed plane carrying undocumented migrants arrested on human smuggling charges. The Presidio County, Texas Sheriff's Office has made an arrest in connection to a failed human smuggling attempt in December 2021. Tobias Penner Peters of Seminole is facing three counts of smuggling of persons, one count of evading arrest, and one count of deadly conduct after authorities say he crashed a plane carrying undocumented migrants. According to PCSO, on December 30th, deputies responded to a plane crash north of the Presidio International Airport. Investigators determined the pilot, later identified as Peters, was trying to smuggle the undocumented migrants by air when a combination of the excess passenger weight and low fuel likely caused the aircraft to crash. Search and rescue efforts resulted in some passengers being taken to the hospital and others being taken in by U.S. Border Patrol. At this time, there is no update on the health status of the passengers. Peters fled the scene, leading to a manhunt that lasted until his arrest on March 25th. From HindustanTimes.com, fake pilot case, trainee Air India co-pilot held. In yet another case of using forged documents to procure a commercial pilot license, Delhi police have arrested a trainee air pilot co-pilot. With this, a total of 22 people have been arrested in such cases so far. The trainee co-pilot has been identified as Surab Lakhanda, 29 years old. The airline regulator had earlier forwarded his name to Delhi police crime branch, claiming he and another colleague of his had submitted forged mark sheets for obtaining the CPL. Lakhanda reportedly told police that he appeared in three pilot license examinations conducted by the GCA, but did not get through. Later, he got in touch with a middleman in Ahmabad, who allegedly told him that he could arrange for a forged results sheet, showing that he passed all of his papers. With this, Delhi police have arrested a total of 12 pilots, three DGCA officials, two middlemen, and two forgers. And finally, from securityinfowatch.com, man arrested after climbing onto wing of jet at Chicago's Midway Airport. A man who lost clothing as he scaled a barbed wire fence at Chicago's Midway Airport was taken into custody after officials say he climbed onto a private jet. The incident occurred around 4.30 p.m. on March 29th at Chicago's second-largest airport, police said. The 30-year-old suspect was believed to be intoxicated. He lost his jacket and shirt as he climbed over the fence and began taking more clothes off as he walked onto the runway. A pilot of a private jet had been cleared for takeoff when the suspect approached their plane, CBS News reported. The suspect then climbed onto the wing of the jet. Quote, this guy is stripping butt naked right now, the pilot told an air traffic controller. He was taken into custody and transported to a hospital for minor injuries. According to the police, charges are pending. DePaul University aviation expert Joseph Scheiderman told WLS, quote, I think we're seeing how easy it is for someone to scale a fence and get into a secure area. In this case, it appears the airport didn't have a lot of operational disruption, but boy, it's a wake-up call that one individual could potentially bring down a transportation network. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up next, our conversation with Rob Mark about VFR into IMC accidents. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. In a moment, we'll be talking with Rob Mark about VFR into IMC. And after talking with Rob, one of the conclusions I reached was that if you fly enough, eventually there's a really good chance that you'll have an encounter with VFR into IMC. We'll talk about the encounters that both he and I had, and certainly we both did everything we could think of to avoid these encounters, which tells me that no matter how careful you are, there's still a chance that you may encounter VFR into IMC. So it's not sufficient to tell pilots to stay out of the clouds. 
Instead, we need to know what to do when it happens. Now, most experts would tell you to immediately transition to your instruments, turn on the autopilot if you have one, and then make a 180 degree standard rate turn to exit the clouds. But there's so much more to know about VFR and IMC, and I hope you'll take the Air Safety Institute's online course, and you'll find a link to it in our show notes. Now here's our conversation with award-winning aviation journalist, Rob Mark. Well, Rob, welcome to the show. Great to have you back. Thanks for inviting me, Max. Uh, it's always an interesting, stimulating discussion with you. Well, I hope that's the case today. This is really an important topic that I know is really near and dear to both of our hearts. Now, part of the reason we're talking about it here today is that AOPA's Air Safety Institute has just launched a focus on VFR into IMC accidents from now through the end of the year, which I think is great. I mean, kudos to them for putting this together. You and I have both gone through the training course. I thought they did a really good job. We'll talk a little bit about that as well as uh, some other ideas that we have in addition. What were your impressions, by the way, as you took the course? I liked it, actually. I, I found that it was a, a great refresher of the uh, topics that contribute to VFR flight into IFR conditions. Are, there were many things that I knew and I went, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. That's a good point. And I think that's the point of, of refresher training is to do just that. And I thought they made a number of really excellent points. For example, they said that the VFR and IMC, the term gets used generically. I love this. In truth, there are hundreds of different scenarios, each with its own unique mix of judgment, circumstance, experience, and luck. And I think you and I have kind of talked about how it's kind of tough to characterize these accidents because they, they happen in just a multitude of ways. I think that's a very good point. I'm not certain simply replaying uh, an accident scenario or rereading it is necessarily going to make the problem pop out at a pilot as much as somebody saying, this happened to me, I, and let me tell you how it happened, and then you know they go on from there. Because you're right, I, VFR and IMC is a problem that we don't see in the in the commercial world. I mean, I looked at some accident data before we started, and the Flight Safety Foundation puts out a, uh, a safety report every year. And there were certainly commercial accidents. Now, they're looking at data worldwide, but there isn't even a category for VFR flight into IMC because professional pilots don't find themselves in those situations. This is the kind of thing that people in small aircraft do because they think they're invulnerable, maybe. And I worry that there may be people who've tuned out already thinking, ah, oh, VFR into IMC, this is just trivial, it's simple, all I have to do is stay out of a cloud, that's all there is to it. And what I really want people to understand is, no, even highly experienced pilots sometimes find themselves in this situation. It's happened to both you and it's happened to me twice, and in both cases, I think we were doing everything possible to try to avoid doing it. So for me, the key point I think is let people know, hey, you may think that, oh, this will never happen to you. And as a younger pilot, I used to always think about all the stuff I read, different kinds of things. Oh, that'll never happen to me. And then some of those things started happening to me. And eventually I realized, oh, I guess mom lied to me. I'm not special. And so I think, first of all, we have to realize that if you fly enough VFR into IMC, might indeed happen to you. It could happen. And what you really need is a strategy for dealing with it once that occurs. And I think that mentioning that it almost assuredly will happen to most pilots at some point. Most pilots don't admit it because they got out of it in one piece, but it, it happened to me a couple, oh, a couple of winters ago. And it was just enough to be eye-opening that I said, holy smokes, I, I've got to talk about this to our safety group at Chicago Executive Airport, because if this can happen to me, a guy that has thousands of hours and ratings and all the other good things, and I'm a instructor for God knows how many years, can happen to anybody. Because was it that I wasn't paying attention? I, I don't think that was it, but it happened to me anyway. 
yeah, I think no matter how hard we work, there are just some circumstances where it may just happen. Let me talk about one of the two instances that occurred to me, and then maybe you can share what happened to you. Both of these were instructional flights for me. On one of my very first flights in a Cirrus SR-22, when I was flying with another instructor who was checking me out in the airplane, we took off from Palo Alto Airport, which was VFR. Now, granted, the ceilings weren't particularly high, but they were over a thousand feet. And what's unique, well, it may not be, actually, it's probably not unique. You know, the, the ceiling measured over the airport can be very different from the ceiling measured over the downwind just a mile away, for example. And so we took off, got up to traffic pattern altitude, and almost immediately found ourselves in lowering visibility that actually became a cloud. Now, granted, it was pretty easy for me to get out of that because the right traffic pattern is over the bay. The bay is at sea level, and we had at least eight or 900 feet below us. And all we had to do is just push forward a little bit on the stick, 100 feet down, poof, we were back out of the clouds. So in my particular case, I think we probably realized that there was some possibility of going into a cloud. We didn't expect to. And yet we also had an out. We had a plan B. And I think that's a critical thing for all pilots to have is to have that plan B. Now, you and I talked about your incident on the Airplane Geeks podcast. But for folks who haven't heard that show, go ahead and tell us what happened to you. I was out a couple of uh, Decembers ago with my daughter and her boyfriend, and uh, we were in a 172, and I uh, took off from executive. I checked the weather, and the intention was that we were going to fly east out of uh, Powaukee over to the lake shore and down the uh, Lake Michigan, the western shoreline, to look at the buildings and see how cool downtown Chicago is from the air. So again, there was a possibility of some snow showers, very intermittent, but basically VFR. And the one thing about whether it's rain showers or snow showers is that when the visibility is good everywhere else, you can see them coming from, you, you can see a, a patch of gray, a patch of almost black weather off to one side or in front of you. And they're very easy to stay away from. In this particular case, once we popped up off the ground, there were a lot more snow showers around than had been forecast. And I, I thought, okay, well, we're probably not going to be able to go as far as we thought we were. But I turned east towards the lakeshore and looked at the uh, the buildings. And I said, well, that's where we're going to go. We're going to go past them down there. And oh, I was changing uh, radio frequencies. And I looked back up and downtown had disappeared. I thought, Okay, I could still see the ground in a lot of, you know, it was pretty clear straight ahead, but off to my right front, downtown it disappeared. Well, and the one thing that we don't think about is that those snow showers have to begin somewhere. So they don't, don't always give you a heads up of, here we are, stay away. And we just happened to be beneath a cloud. And once it started to snow, it happened just like that. And suddenly, all I could see was straight down, and I went right on the instruments. Of course, I made a 180 out because I was hoping that that was going to do it, but I, I could only go one way because I was under the edge of the Class B for Chicago, so I knew I couldn't go uh, to the right. It had to be left. And I'll bet I was in a turn. And I think, as you said once, when you're making a standard rate turn, it seems to take forever to at least even make a 180. And maybe in it, two minutes, and I popped out. I'm like, okay, I think it just happened to me. And after that, we, we realized where we weren't going to be able to go and saw some of what we saw. And then we went back in and landed. And uh, my daughter's boyfriend was in the right seat. And he said, what happened up there? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, all of a sudden you were talking and you were very casual and, and then you got really quiet and I looked over and I saw your eyes were focused on the instruments. Was that bad? I said, no, actually it was good that I, I was focused in the right place, but we ended up someplace I didn't expect to be because there weren't supposed to be any snow showers out there. But as I said to them later on the way home, but of course, it's just a forecast. 
How many times have you heard the local weatherman say, it's going to be partly sunny tomorrow, highs in the uh, upper 70s, uh, you know, clear sky, and, and suddenly it's foggy, and because they get it wrong. And we, we depend on them as if they always get it right. And that's one of the things the, uh, the AOPA course mentions is be careful because it's just a forecast that you're depending on. Well, you certainly did things right. What we've all heard and what we all teach is if you go into the cloud, immediately look at the instruments. And if you're not instrument capable, I'll tell you the one you really want to pay attention to is your attitude indicator. You know, spend probably 80% of your time looking at that, keeping the wings level, keeping your pitch relatively constant, you know, cross check against your airspeed and altitude to see that you're still staying at relatively the uh, same altitude and then start that 180. Now, if pilots were to use an autopilot, as soon as they enter a cloud, they would probably avoid many of these accidents. The problem of course, is many airplanes don't have an autopilot. What about the airplane you were flying? Uh, it did not have an autopilot, so there was no option there. And I know another option that AOPA mentions in some of the uh, literature is that sometimes it's it's beneficial to climb because you're worried about striking something on the ground if you can't see it anymore. However, in my case, I said, I can't go up. I mean, I was only 500 feet beneath the edge of the uh, Class B. I mean, I knew I couldn't go up and I knew I couldn't go to the south. So I, I already had that picture going in my head long before I ever even entered the clouds. Because when you fly around terminal areas, you just do that. You just know where you can be and where you can't and what frequency to be on if you need help. But think about some poor private pilot who has... Uh, gotten his license maybe 11 years ago, hasn't flown much since, went out and took a flight review, flew an hour, maybe an hour and a half with somebody and said, okay, I'm, I'm feeling good. When was that person last in charge of an airplane with total reference to the instruments? I'll bet they couldn't even remember. And that's what's really, really dangerous. Yeah, certainly we have an opportunity every two years when we are required to take a flight review, what some people still call a BFR, to get ourselves under the hood. And yet I think a lot of pilots uh, don't do that or a lot of flight instructors don't force them to do it. And yet it's a great opportunity to help people be more prepared for these kinds of situations where they might accidentally find themselves in a cloud or in snow showers. I was doing some research on the FAA website and I love the fact that they spend a fair amount of money in their medical research division exploring a lot of these kinds of issues. And I found a study, and of course, this, these titles are you know, way too long, but this was Understanding the Human Factors Associated with Visual Flight Rules, Flight into Instrument Meteorological Conditions. And they studied a large number of accidents over a number of years. And they came up with a number of differences between uh, VFR and IMC accidents as opposed to all other types of accidents. One of the things they found is that with VFR and IMC accidents, the pilots tend to have a little less experience, a little you know, fewer total hours than people who have other kinds of accidents. And yet the median, that is, if you, you know, look at half the accidents, uh, pilots have more hours and half the accident pilots have fewer hours. The median for VFR and IMC flights is 731 hours of flight experience. Now, I'm guessing a lot of people figure, oh, this happens mostly to pilots with two or 300 hours, and it doesn't. We had an accident that occurred a few years ago here with a 10,000-hour ATP pilot who was flying, of all things, a Cessna Caravan, a Cessna 208, a very capable aircraft. It was a very short repositioning flight from Concord, California to the Reed Hillview Airport, and I'm just going to take a wild guess that it's probably 30 miles perhaps between those two airports. But there's significant terrain with hills that rise up to about 3,100 feet along that particular route. Both airports are relatively close to sea level. And it was uh, earlier in the day, so I think this occurred probably before 9 o'clock. There were still some lingering clouds around. And this gentleman, for whatever reason, chose not to file a IFR flight plan. And I, I can understand because... There are certainly a lot more time required to do that. And the vast majority of the time in this area, yeah, you can complete flights 
VFR. But the trouble is when the clouds mixes with the mountains, yes, some of the time you can get through and some of the time you can't. And so we're never 100% sure on those circumstances. And this gentleman, despite his 10,000 hours of experience and past experience in successfully making these kinds of flights, decided to take off. And unfortunately, he paid the ultimate price. I think you touched on such an important point. People listening to this may think, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a VFR-only pilot anymore. I have an instrument rating. Now, I haven't flown in a couple of years under the instrument conditions. I Yeah, I haven't really shot the approaches, but, but I'm still instrument qualified. And trust me, that that doesn't mean much. You're a little better off than you are a VFR pilot because you've had more time under the hood. But a non-current IFR pilot, look at the data. There are quite a few of the VFR into IMC accidents that occurred when the pilot already held an instrument rating. Yes, depending upon which study you read, somewhere between 30 and 50% of VFR into IMC accidents occur with instrument pilots. Now, none of those studies really know how many of those pilots were current, how many had flown instruments recently. But I think many of us who are instrument rated feel like, well, hey, we can go ahead and fly in somewhat marginal VFR conditions because if you know we find ourselves in trouble, we can always just switch to IFR. And that's often not the case. So for example, I've put together a scenario that I often given presentations that I give uh, locally in which I talk about, hey, you're flying over the, the Livermore Airport, which is uh, in a, an area that's surrounded by low mountains pretty much on all sides. And you find yourself uh, you know, going into clouds. What can you do? And there are multiple options. And a lot of people think just, well, hey, I can do a, a request an IFR pop-up clearance. <laughs> and the answer turns out that actually you can't because the minimum vectoring altitude directly over the airport is 4,000 feet, which would be 3,600 feet above that particular airport. And if you move just slightly to the north or the south, the minimum vectoring altitude is 4,500 feet. So if you're flying under some type of uh, you know, overcast, you're not going to be able to get up to that altitude in order to pick up your pop-up IFR clearance. So it's pretty counterintuitive to people that they, they don't even realize in their own backyard, oh, I can't get a pop-up clearance when I may need it most. Turns out the answer in that particular scenario is to land at Livermore, then get an IFR clearance, which puts you on a departure procedure where you can safely climb up to the minimum vectoring altitude. So sometimes it's not always obvious to people that instrument pilots are not at much of a you know advantage relative to VFR pilots when they choose to fly in marginal conditions. I think that's also a good point because I'm a, uh, a flatlander, as they call us. I mean, the highest hill we have out here is 200 feet or something up to the northwest. I mean, we don't even think about that kind of thing. And if we call O'Hare for a pop-up, they almost always give it to us. But you can't guarantee that anywhere because it's all workload permitting. And VFR flights are uh, not as high a priority as an IFR flight. The fact that you are an IFR pilot and you suddenly decided, oh my gosh, I'm in a bad spot here. I need an IFR clearance. Doesn't mean that the, uh, the controller needs to drop what they're doing to help you at that point if he's got a, you know six or eight other airplanes. Now, I will tell you that they most likely will once they realize the situation you're in. But then, too, it, it depends on what the uh, pilot is willing to share with the controller. Sometimes people don't want to admit that they've gotten themselves in a situation. Well, and I think people choose to fly in marginal weather for all kinds of reasons. I found this just a couple of days ago on AINonline.com. And it says FBO fees may have motivated VFR into IMC uh, accident. And you might think, well, wait a minute. How could the FBO fees affect somebody and cause an accident? The story is the final report related to the crash of an Augusta A109 helicopter in June 2019 out of New York City. It says the helicopter was destroyed and the solo pilot killed when it crashed into the roof of a 54-story building as the pilot tried to take advantage 
of a 20 minute weather window to reposition the helicopter from the East 34th Street heliport to Linden, New Jersey. Five to seven minutes after taking off, the pilot radioed the heliport asking to return and was told to land on pad four. Then he said he did not know where he was. Reported ceilings range from 500 feet in Central Park, which was about one mile northeast of the accident site, to 1,000 feet at the Manhattan Wall Street heliport. Witness video showed the helicopter going in and out of the clouds, and ADSB flight track data showed it flying erratically above the East River with severe heading and altitude changes before turning 270 degrees to approach the heliport from the west. About 500 feet from the pad, it reversed course and flew over Manhattan before crashing onto the rooftop. FBO staff reported that the pilot had checked the weather constantly for the two hours after dropping off a pilot-rated passenger. They also noted that keeping the ship on the pad would have incurred parking fees starting at $200 per hour and a $250 overnight fee in addition to landing fees. He had told both his brother and his girlfriend that he was nervous about the weather and that he, quote, shouldn't be flying but had to. The extent to which the FBO fees increase their pressure on the pilot is known. Wow. I know often people do things which are financially motivated either to you know, try to avoid fees or to save money. Pilots, I would say, on average, are probably successful and have earned the money to be able to fly airplanes in part by being able to figure out how to manage their money wisely. Sometimes that can get them into trouble if they start trying to save every darn penny and it costs them their life. I have noticed in my years of flying that sometimes pilots are the cheapest people I've ever met. They have extremely sophisticated airplanes that cost them a lot of money, but they will easily fly an hour away to save uh, 50 cents a gallon on gas, which when the weather's good, I mean, that I don't have a problem with that. But if the weather is shaky, why would you take that kind of risk to save a few pennies? In this particular case, I mean, in Augusta 109, used ones are out there for a couple million dollars. A new one is probably five or six million dollars. And as you and I both know, helicopters are not cheap to operate. The cost per hour is astronomical compared to fixed wing airplanes. And uh, to say that, I'm sorry, I must go fly in weather that's already making me nervous because I can't afford the $250 pad fee. No, I just must go. I must risk my life in order to save the boss a few dollars. I'm sorry if they fire you because of this. Consider yourself lucky. Yeah, totally. I still remember years ago, we had a pilot who was flying at night in weather. He has had his private for just a couple of months. He was going from E-16, the San Martin Airport, back to uh, Fresno. And he told pilots, I have to be back there on Monday. And they said, hey, the weather's not good. You know, maybe you should wait. No, no, I have to to be there. And he took off at night, headed toward the mountains, which are probably around 3,000 feet in that area. And he realized he was in trouble and he was headed back. But unfortunately, uh, he made that decision too late and he crashed. So he was wrong. You know, he said I had to be there on Monday, but he was wrong because Monday occurred and he was not there. So I think people need to be really, really, really careful and look at the big picture, which is the goal for any flight is to land somewhere safely. The goal is not to get to the airport that you plan to be at. The goal is to be somewhere safely. And you got to keep that in mind. In fact, that somewhere safely, this was one of the quiz answers on the the AOPA, uh, ASI, uh, VFR, and IMC course was landing, uh, you know, in a field somewhere. You know, that's a viable option. The goal is to land safely somewhere. That is the ultimate goal. And, and you and I both know that uh, uh, last year we lost a mutual friend down in Texas. That And honestly, it didn't even include bad weather along the way. Uh, near his home airport, but he began having mechanical problems and he kept pushing it because he apparently wanted to get back home to get the airplane fixed. 
and he pushed it and pushed it and pushed it. And how many empty fields did we figure that he passed? I mean, dozens where he could have just kept the gear up, slid it into a, a, a farmer's field, probably tore it up the bottom somewhat, but he would be here telling us the story. And he's not because he, he got himself into such a corner that he lost control of the airplane on approach to the airport and he died. And that was a case where he very desperately wanted to show his airplane off at a 4th of July event. He was going to be the only warbird, if you will, at that particular event. So he was strongly motivated to get there. And it was on the way home, unfortunately, where he had uh, that particular accident. You know, there was another accident which was described in the AOPA training course, which happened uh, in your backyard. I think they call that the, the DuPage uh, crash in which a Cirrus pilot, an SR-20 pilot from Indiana, was flying up to Pawaukee to uh, basically drop off his daughter and daughter's friend at college. And he got into low visibilities. The ceiling at, I guess it was DuPage, was about 900 to overcast. I mean, it's kind of surprising, but he kept asking, hey, if I could land it at one point, he kind of said, oh, I thought that the VFR minimums for landing were 800 feet. Well, this poor pilot didn't even know that you needed a thousand foot ceiling to be able to land VFR. He was not IFR capable. He really flipped and flopped a lot as to which airport he was going to land at, which airport he was going to go to. And the point that they make is that this pilot was communicating pretty clearly that he had multiple objectives in mind that he was trying to accomplish. He not only wanted to get his daughters back to college, but it was very important for him to not get stuck at that airport because he apparently had other things that he wanted to do. And so that really, I think, clouded his judgment. I pulled up the NTSB report for this particular crash and buried in it, I found a piece of information uh, that was not discussed in the AOPA course. And sure enough, he did have something that he wanted to do. This was a Saturday. In the wreckage, they found a ticket for an Indianapolis Colts football game valid for the next day, Sunday. And they found that in the accident debris. So here's a pilot who didn't want to safely land at an airport and then get stuck there because there was something he wanted to do the next day. Now, again, we don't know, at least I don't know, I remember that accident vaguely, but I don't know what colleges the the pilot was trying to get the girls to. But I mean, it's it's a pain to drive from DuPage to Palwaukee. It's probably going to take you 45 minutes. And in traffic, it could be an hour. But again, I always used to think of it, if I was in a simulator, uh, with a student, and they started doing something like, I'd stop the simulator and say, okay, why are we doing this? Why are you going to this place in these conditions? Well, uh, you know, I pretended like I needed to get up to, is it worth your life? My life? <laughs> and they always look at you like, what do you mean my life? I'm not going to kill myself. Come on. Uh, really? Really? then unfortunately, you, you may have a certificate, but you have really missed a basic grasp of, of the physics of what goes on in the world, not just the airplane, but of, of the atmosphere and what you could find. And, you know, he could have declared an emergency. And I, cause I remember where he, where he crashed, but he, he passed up, uh, he could have he could have gone into O'Hare. They still had the Northwest runways at that point. He could have made a right turn VFR and landed O'Hare. And I mean, yeah, he would have declared an emergency. He would have probably gotten yelled at by the FAA. But you know, he'd still be here, and he's not. And neither are his daughters. Well, it's interesting you bring up being yelled at by the FAA. There were two accidents that were featured in the AOPA ASI course in which pilots told ATC, yes, I am IFR capable, and then started taking instructions for IFR approaches, even though they were private pilots. I have no doubt that in both cases, the pilots felt like, gee, I don't have many other options. So what the heck, I'll just go ahead and lie, and I'll fake my way through this instrument approach for which I am not properly trained. And all I can tell you is, you're not going to get in trouble if you tell them, hey, I'm stuck in IMC, I need your help getting out of here. If you tell them you're instrument capable, 
they're not going to give you the kind of help that they would give a private pilot who's not instrument rated. They're going to be giving you help that says, hey, we're going to help you fly this instrument approach for which you were not trained to fly. If on the other hand, you tell them, hey, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not instrument capable. They're going to give you a different kind of help, which is going to be you know, vectors to get you out of the soup into VFR conditions as soon as possible. So I think, unfortunately, by fearing retribution from the FAA for, oh my gosh, I'm in a cloud and I'm not instrument rated, and then lying about it and saying, oh yeah, I'm instrument rated, people are making things worse. It's a shame, but I remember uh, being very adamant about a situation I had with a controller uh, on landing at an airport. And I said, no, I did not do that. He said, yes, you did. And because I blew through an intersection and I said, you did not tell me to hold short. He said, I did. And you acknowledged it. I said, I did not. And so after we got it, I realized talk, yell, you know, arguing on the radio was a waste of time. We weren't getting anywhere. And even though I was taxing at the time, uh, I, I said, this is, this is good to get somebody hurt probably me. And after I, uh, after I put the airplane away, I called the tower and I said, can I come over and listen to the recording? He said, sure, absolutely. Because they record all air traffic control communications. And we got to the point where I went, okay, here it comes. Six, eight golf, uh, uh, clear to land this runway, hold short of the crossing run. I went six, eight golf will do. And I went, oh my God, I did acknowledge it. I did tell this guy I would do it, and yet I got distracted by something else, and I just went sailing through. And you know what? When we were done, I said, so this is going to be a big deal, right? And he went, well, he said, did you learn anything? I mean, we were in the tower, and I said, oh, yeah, I'm not near as good as I think I am sometimes. He went, okay, then you learned what you needed to learn, didn't you? I went, wow, yeah. But these days, if you blow through an intersection, you could get a uh, a call from the FISDO. At very worst, if if they don't like what you said, they may say, well, you know what? Why don't you go fly with uh, why don't you go fly with a local instructor? In this case, Max Trescott, and he's just going to kind of scope it out and see if you know you're up to snuff to uh, to maintain you know that you're current and all that. And you go, yeah, okay, I did the deed. I've just got to pay the price. And it happens. But you know what? Better that than having an accident. And people always think in these VFR into IMC situations, I can handle. I'm not going to be dumb enough to go fly into a cloud. I'm just, I'm not going to do it. Oh, really? What about at night? We talked, you and I talked, Max, about the, uh, uh, the difficulty of uh, gauging your visibility out the window when you're when you're flying in the daytime and people are not very good with that but at night good luck i mean it's almost impossible unless you happen to see a a brightly lit ground object that you you recognize at night you you can't really judge distance very well and of course you also can't see a cloud coming you can't see a a snow shower coming or a rain shower until you're in it. Yes. Let me get to that point in just a moment. But to your uh, previous story about your interaction with the FAA, to me, that is exactly the best possible outcome. You had a conversation, you found out the facts, you learned something from it. And the FAA said, well, good, you know, job done. Pilot learned something. And that really is fits with the recently called their compliance philosophy. I think they've changed it now to compliance program. And you and I have been pilots for decades and decades. And over the years, we've seen the pendulum swing at the FAA from the kinder, gentler FAA to the more, what can I say, uh, enforcement, uh, happy and oriented FAA. I was going to say punitive, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. We are clearly in the kinder, gently phase now. And the, and the compliance program is just that. It basically says, let's educate the pilot. And if they show any kind of attitude toward being interested in learning and improving, then, hey, that's going to be the the end of it. And so that was indeed what happened with you. And I think that's the, the best possible outcome. And people should really expect that. Hey, if you need to chat with the FAA, maybe you made this mistake. Be open to the idea that it was actually your mistake and not somebody else's and learn from that. 
I also, as I remembering uh, some VFR into IMC accidents when I was uh, when I was still a controller in a tower. I remember one evening uh, it was starting to snow, not heavy. Maybe the visibility was down to just below three miles. But again, and I noticed when I'm looking out the window because I had time to just you know lean against the window and look out and see the world and watch the weather and. And a guy called up in, in a bonanza and said he wanted to go uh, VFR westbound. And I said, hey, you know, information Delta is uh, on the air and it's, uh, it says we're IFR, state your intentions. And that's the required phraseology. We don't say, well, what, what would you like to try this or do you want to do that? Or you, you can't do that. The controllers don't want to take that. Well, the FAA doesn't want to take that risk. And so the, uh, the pilot was smart enough to say, well, I'll take a special VFR. And so once it's, it was night, we, are, we were required to say, are you instrument equipped and qualified? And he said, sure. Now, that's all I can do. I mean, uh, you know, we're going to head westbound. Okay. He got up to the runway and, uh, you know, I gave him his special VFR clearance, which we had to coordinate with, uh, with O'Hare. And, and what it does is for controllers, we couldn't let another aircraft into the control zone at the time they were called, say, on an IFR approach. Or if this guy wanted to go special, he had to wait until an IFR that was already on an approach was down and, and landed safely. Anyway, he took off and he made it about half a mile past the departure end of the runway and crashed in a field. He killed himself. And uh, later on, we found he wasn't equipped. He wasn't equipped for IFR. He wasn't uh, qualified for IFR flight, but he'd heard that somewhere. I bet. Oh, just ask him for a special VFR. You know, uh, it's it's it, they get you right out. But uh, when when you take off in snow showers, you're IFR, especially at night. And the guy lost his life. I mean, we could talk about these kinds of things all day long, where pilots made really dumb decisions. The question is, how do we get through to pilots to make them realize that th this is a dumb decision before they make it and kill themselves and or their passengers? Well, a starting point would be for them to simply know the regulations and then to follow them 100% of the time and to never lie. Because frankly, when a pilot is lying, the only person they are cheating is themselves. Here you have a case of a pilot who lied about being instrument rated. And guess who paid the price? He paid that price. I think, too, that pilots, uh, especially people that own rather sophisticated airplanes, pay a lot of money for these airplanes. And they think, I'm pretty smart. I would never do that. I mean, I, look, look at the companies I've built or uh, that I, I run and... Uh, I haven't built these into successful businesses by making stupid decisions. I mean, come on. However, when they decide to go flying and they uh, earn a, a certificate, they don't have that much experience in that business of flying. And they've got to understand it's a completely different mindset. It's not impossible. I mean, it's not, it's not uh, difficult to... Uh, to cope with, but you must respect the limitations that uh, nature, your aircraft, the local air traffic situation put on you. And if you ignore those, you do that at your own peril. Yeah, there's no question. I've mentioned on the show a study that uh, the FAA, or uh, yes, it was definitely the FAA, did in which they found that fully 30% of all fatal accidents involved violation of uh, an FAR so yeah, you got to know the rules. You got to follow the rules. If you don't, you do so at your own peril. Getting back to what you said a moment ago about uh, night VFR into IMC, I found another study while looking through the FAA websites in which they compared the number of VFR into IMC accidents that occur during daylight conditions versus night conditions. And essentially they're saying a little bit less than two thirds of all the VFR and IMC accidents occurred in the daytime, which means more than a third of them 
happened at night. Interestingly, when you compare the all other kinds of accidents that occurred at night, they're totally swamped by VFR into IMC. So that tells you that the majority of accidents at night are VFR into to IMC. For many years, I've given a talk at Oshkosh on night flying safety, and typically there will be about 200 people in the audience. And I'll always ask them, how many of you fly more than 20% of your flight hours at night? And we'll get a couple hands. And how many fly more than 10%? We get a few more. I get to 5%. And the most I've ever seen is maybe a quarter, maybe a third of the, the hands go up in the room. My conclusion from that has been that basically most GA pilots fly fewer than 5% of their flight hours at night. In one other study, I saw that fully 50% of the accidents uh, VFR to IMC accidents occurred at night, which is just slightly different from this study. And what that tells you is there's about a 10x time, greater chance of you having a VFR into IMC accident at night than in the daytime. If half the VFR to IMCs happen at night and only 5% of the flying is at night, that's a 10x difference. So yes, uh, the other VFR into IMC incident that I had occurred at night. With student pilots, we need to do at least three hours of flying at night, and we have to do at least one night cross country, a distance of more than 50 miles. I flew a flight from San Jose's Reed Hillview Airport up to the Napa Airport, which is a little bit more than 50 miles away, and our route took us along the San Francisco Bay. And as we were coming back somewhere north of Oakland, probably in the, the Richmond area, we briefly went into a cloud and it's amazing because that was actually a pretty well lit area. And I knew that there were some clouds out there and I was working extremely hard to avoid them. Even in spite of the fact of how well lit it was, I still went into that cloud briefly accidentally. Again, I had a plan B. I knew that the San Francisco Bay was immediately on our right. So we turned probably 10, 15 degrees to the right started to send a little bit and were, was out of that cloud again uh, very quickly. So yeah, I think people probably underestimate how easy it is to get into a cloud at night. As you said, it's pretty hard to do because you really can't see the clouds even under the best of circumstances. No, and I think you are absolutely right on the money that, uh, well, I of course can judge distances because I have lots of experience and I've been flying for X number of years and uh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. So then why did you get yourself into this situation, assuming you were lucky enough to get into it and get out of it? Because sometimes there are elements of the atmosphere that are simply out of your control. Nature doesn't say, when we dump weather on you that you don't expect, we're going to make certain that it's perfectly uh, uniform and that it happens in a way that you'll be able to recognize what's going on and get through the problem. It doesn't happen like that. I mean, I, I had a student not not that long ago that was, uh, we he came out to the airport. I said, look, I don't think we, we really wanted to go out and do air work. And it was a thousand and three. And he said, oh yeah, let's go. I said, yeah, but it, it's a thousand and three. What does a thousand foot ceiling mean? Where where are the base of the clouds? How high will you be before you should enter them? He said, "We there's plenty of room." I said, "Oh, is there really? Oh yeah, yeah. We could do we could do maneuvers and all." I said, "Okay, let's go, let's go." So we went out and took off, and uh, he's climbing like he always does, you know, and, and he's. She's looking at the instruments and it's looking really good. And I can see that we're not far from the bases of the clouds. And uh, he's still brrr, climbing along. And suddenly, whoop, he went. And I looked over him and his eyes were as big as you can, like a hoot owl. And I said, pull the power back. And he, he just kind of froze, and I pulled the power back. And like the example you just gave, we were back out of it in a couple of seconds. And later on the ground, he said, how'd that happen? <laughs> I said, because the information I really thought you understood, you really did not. Because he could repeat the 1,003 VFR minimums, 
but what does it look like in the air when you're getting close to busting those minimums? And uh, obviously had no idea at all. And, and that's the thing that's really scary is that sometimes you can get people who can repeat the letter of the law. They can quote you the regs all day long, but can they apply any of what they've learned when they're in an airplane and they're in an unusual situation? VFR and IMC, I should make a 180 degree turn. Really? At what rate would you turn? I, I, I turn fast because I want to get out of it. No, that's really the worst idea you can make. Uh, that's the worst decision you could make. Well, I'll I'll climb and then I'll I'll you know because I don't want to hit anything, so I'll, I'll climb and and then start turning back the other way. A climbing left turn you're going to make to get out of the, and you think, oh my lord, this is really scary because you when they can tell you this when they're calm, you, you think, oh my Lord, this person would be in serious trouble if they ever got into the clouds. And you, you need to you know, turn off the machinery and say, okay, look, we, we've got to have a heart to heart chat here and really unload on them the, the, the realistic part of flying, that things happen that you don't plan for and you've got to be ready for it. It's not just about passing the test. Well, this kind of ties into a third point I mentioned at the very beginning of the show. I've concluded that if you fly enough hours, that there's a really good chance you'll end up in a cloud. The second point, you absolutely need a strategy for when you do that. And you need to have figured that out long before you end up in the cloud. These are the kinds of things you need to sort through while you're on the ground in the comfort of your easy chair, because once you get yourself into that situation, you will no longer be able to think rationally and come up with the best possible solution. But the third point is that pilots are not taught how to estimate visibility. And as I was searching through studies on the FAA website in preparation for a conversation, I came across a study that was done by the FAA's medical group out of Oklahoma City. And they did some simulations in which they took three groups of pilots to see how good they were at estimating visibilities in flight. And they had the control group, which got very little training. They had another group that was taught how to estimate visibility by looking first at a sectional chart at the route they were going to fly, noting all the landmarks along the way, noting the distances between those landmarks. And then as they flew the route in the simulator, estimate how good the visibility was as they flew in route. The third group was taught a rule of thumb, which was that as you look out the cockpit, if you look right over the nose and you look at the ground in front of you, that if you are uh, 1,000 feet above the ground, then that visibility, the point you can see at the ground just above the nose is about a mile. At 2,000 feet, it's two miles. At 3,000 feet, it's three miles. So what they're saying is if you're at 3,000 feet and you look over the nose at the ground and you can see the ground, then that's about three mile visibility. Now they did point out that this varies considerably between aircraft, it kind of depends upon you know, the shape of the cowling of that particular airplane. It depends on how high you're sitting in the seat. And they gave some methodologies for uh, figuring out for your particular airplane exactly how to adjust this rule of thumb. But th what the study found was really fascinating. They found that regardless of the category, that pilots severely underestimated visibility for long distances. So if you're trying to, if you're in visibility of 10 to 30 miles, pilots tend to underestimate that visibility. But the opposite was also true. For visibilities below 10 miles, there was a tendency for pilots to overestimate their visibility. So for example, if they were in, you know, three mile visibility, they thought they were in five mile visibility. And as I think about it, I don't think there's ever been a point in my training where anybody said, and here's how you estimate visibility. And if I think about all the articles I've read, I can't remember anything related to this. I think one time I read one thing, which I have used from time to time, which is to look at the length of runways as you're flying along of you know, airports that you're passing. If, for example, the length of that runway is 6,000 feet, now you know that you're looking at something that's about a nautical mile long and then you can kind of estimate how many of those links there are between you and the airplane. So for example, if it looks like you're four runway links away from that runway that's one nautical mile long, 
you're four miles away from it. So I thought this was really important because here's an area that I think is a real hole in pilot training. We talk about, hey, three mile visibility is required for VFR. And you're going to have to guess that because we're not giving you any tools for figuring out whether you've got three miles or not. When did this research come out? Uh, it's sometime within the past 15 years or so. I, I have never seen this piece of research. And I I think you've also, you come up with some good points. You know, you really do. Uh, I think I have never had an instructor ever work on, here's how you estimate visibility. I can remember when I was learning to land, people would say, okay, you see the the length of that, that right, there's a 5,000 foot runway out in front of us. Can, you can imagine, you know, maybe kind of uh, uh, how many lengths away from the airport you think you are to estimate your distance to the airport. But as far as visibility, I don't think I've ever seen anything like this. I mean, where did the FAA publish this? <laughs> I think that's one of the challenges. They publish some great stuff using the PhDs that work for the FAA. And these studies just get, they get filed away and uh, they, they aren't widely publicized. So yeah, I think the, the FAA has some just real gems, some real nuggets that they've uncovered. And anyway, hopefully this will be one tool that people can use for, uh, for estimating in-flight visibility. But let's get back to um, the AOPA um, course. They had summarized their key points from the course, and I'm going to include a link to the show notes. I'm hoping that everybody who's listening to this will go out and take that particular course. And here's what we want to kind of emphasize. They said the key takeaway points were, one, anytime the temperature is within a few degrees of the dew point, be on the lookout for IMC. Two, weather changes unexpectedly and forecasts are often wrong. Monitor your situation and act if things change for the worst. Three, proficiency deteriorates much faster than confidence. And around IMC, overconfidence will get you killed. We've talked about a few examples of that. Four, the weather is what you find, not what was forecast. Smart pilots are always pessimistic about forecast. Five, give yourself an out. That would be the plan B I've talked about. If you really need to get there, have an ironclad backup plan. Six, in trouble, use your autopilot and make sure ATC knows about the problem. Seven, remember what's at stake. No trip is worth dying for. So as I said, the goal is always a safe landing somewhere. You, uh, I think you summarized it very well. I think you may have left out one important point about this course. It's absolutely free. It doesn't cost you anything to take this course. So it's like so much uh, information. We talk about it, safety seminars and IMC, VMC club meetings, and it doesn't cost you anything. You might learn something. So again, I, I went through the course and I, I absolutely loved it because I saw reminders. And when old guys like me can say, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. That's I mean, it's, it's great because that's what we want everyone else to, uh, to, to say. Or, you know, I don't know that much about that. I think I better get some. I better go fly with somebody. And let the instructor challenge you a little bit. Anybody can meet minimum standards, but there's no there's no rule again in nature that says nature must throw you a, a situation based on your experience. It may throw you one that you have never experienced before, and that's the judgment that you need to use at some point to get yourself out of it safely. And I just want to throw out a big tip of the hat to Richard McSpadden of AOPA's Air Safety Institute and to AOPA. I think this is just outstanding course. I think this really could make a difference. It made me think about things that I had never thought about, uncover information that I had not been aware of. And this is so important to aviation. We just don't seem to have been able to crack this problem, but I think this is a really excellent step in the right direction. So my congratulations to them on a job well done. And again, I hope everybody will take the course. And if, if you're not a member of AOPA, join, I think the dues are 75 bucks a year or something like that. But there are so many resources up on the ASI, the uh, Air Safety Institute website that, again, they're free. 
you just have to take the time to read them. So, you know, maybe if you're waiting for an airplane, maybe don't watch the last episode of some favorite TV show, pull up the website and, and read something that could make you a better and most importantly, a safer pilot. And we haven't had time to talk about all the things that were in the course. Some of these accidents that they talked about, some of the details are just heartrending. And I think it's really important for pilots to take the time, go through all the materials on this site, and it's probably going to make you a better pilot and it may save the life of you and your passengers. And don't be afraid to ask questions. If, if they throw something at you in the course that you don't understand for some reason, or uh, perhaps you don't understand why, what the importance of that is, go find your local instructor and say, hey, you know what? I took this and I, I don't quite understand what they were talking about. Can, can you spend some time? And, and most instructors will be glad to do it. Rob, thank you so very much for taking the time to talk with us today. This to me is such an incredibly important topic, and I think you've really helped uh, shed a lot of light on it. So thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me again. I think this is an incredibly important topic that we don't talk about nearly enough. And my thanks to Rob for joining us to talk about this very important topic. And if you can think of anyone you know who might benefit from hearing this show, if you would, please go ahead and forward it on to them. Tell them about the Aviation News Talk podcast and encourage them to subscribe or if they're in Apple Podcasts to follow this podcast. That certainly helps our rankings as it shows more people signing up to join this show. And stick around for a moment. You might want to check and see, since aviation is such a small community, which of these people that you know. These are people who signed up in the last week to support us as members of Patreon. And, you know, it just takes about five minutes. I bet you could do that as well, too, if you'd like to support the show. It's really easy. Head on out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. That takes you to our Patreon website where you can look at the different dollar amounts that you can choose to support us at, all the different goodies you'll get at the different support levels. For example, at the $20 a month level, people get to see the three or four bonus videos that I post each month. And just in the last week, I've posted two videos. One was uh, the Morristown Learjet crash, where I showed you the flight path and also the airspeeds of two jets, the one that landed four minutes earlier and the accident jet that landed and crashed on the runway. I also shot some video in a Diamond DA-42. It was the first time I was testing GoPros in that aircraft and I shared some of the uh, settings and findings that I found from uh, shooting in the air. So you may want to check those out. Again, just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome and enter a credit card and you can join as a member or if you'd like to support us with a one-time donation, just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. My thanks to Mark Echeverria, Eric Fisher, Jacques Demoss, who edited his pledge up to $20 a month, David Carter, who edited his pledge up to $8 a month, Ross Oliver, Dory Resnick, Grant Bledsoe at the $20 a month level, James Burgess at $20 a month, and Brian Beerley. I really want to thank all of you for your contributions and thank everyone who supports this show in any way. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. <laughs>